Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. We know we have uh, attendees uh, connecting from all around the world. Thanks so much for being with us today. It is our pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and last webinar of this series of workshops focused on traceability. Uh, this is a series of organized by WWF as part of the GCRF Trade Hub initiative, which is funded by the UKRI uh, Global Challenges Research Fund. Before I present today's expert moderator, I'd like to very briefly remind you that the webinar will be recorded and made available on YouTube. Your microphone will be muted and your camera off, so please write any comments or questions through the chat, including the name of the speaker you are addressing your question to, and we will raise them during the Q&A time. If you had any technical issues, please send a direct chat message to technical support um, Laura Mack. And so now we can start. It is our pleasure to present Ms. Ying Yang, Sen Senior Program Officer in Sustainable Food Consumption and Green Supply Chains at WWF China. Welcome and thank you, Ying, for moderating today's webinar. It is our pleasure to have you with us today. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for your introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Wang Ying from WWF China. It is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Yang Timmers, Global Policy and Advocacy Lead of DCF Supply Chains at WWF Brazil. We'll talk about WWF's guiding principles and asks for DCF supply chains. Many thanks, Yang. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, uh, very grateful uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I will take over my uh, Do you hear me well? Thank you very much. Uh, so I will present here um, a very very clear uh, little synthesis of uh, our WWF DCF uh, asks uh, for for uh, conversion and differentiation and conversion to supply chain. So I am here in China together with me, and so my my time uh, is a bit delayed, and I'm having a big the heavy jet lag. So be very sorry for my English, uh, but I I hope I'll be as clear as possible. So. The uh, aim of the DCF, the differentiation and competition we ask, is to provide clear and precise recommendations to companies, governments, and financial institutions. Because in the last years, we had so many different definitions and asks in differentiation and conversion, and we believe it was very important to be able to align and create clarity to these asks. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, these asks were based on existing references and they were built on upon uh, the guiding principles. Uh, so, sorry, uh, this is, they just, uh, so, so it was based on uh, on two existing references. Uh, the accountability framework is a major reference on deforestation and conversion to supply chain, but also on commodity specific roadmaps. And it's been uh, based on the consultation of partners and officers for uh, more than one year. Next, please. So uh, the two documents that arose from these efforts are first guiding principles that are the fundamentals of what should DCF supply chains uh, propose. And that was based on uh, um, um, accumulated learning of what has worked and not worked for having progress in differentiation and conversion free supply chains. And then uh, the asks are summarizing and having detailed asks for each segment of the supply chain. So uh, uh, the, the downstream players, the upstream companies, the governments, the producers, uh, each had specific uh, role in uh, establishing differentiation and conversion free supply chains. And this is what uh, I will be seeing. Present here. Next, please. 
So, uh, I think uh, on one slide, I am sorry because uh, I see some instability in the signal here. Is it, in, is it possible to present the previous slide, please? So, we have uh, we have learned that we need uh, that the, 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 the demand for deforestation and conversion to supply chain is not a name by itself. It is a critical step stopping deforestation and an element of achieving the global climate diversity targets. And it's also we have to remind that a critical uh, safety net against the emergence of new global pandemics. Uh, it's one of the main things that we have to remind as a principle. It is not by itself, and we are now defending that this is a, a critical element of the global biodiversity framework as well as the, the global climate uh, goals to include that, act, that specific action. It is not about only protecting forests and avoiding the restriction of forests. So it's not just about deforestation, but all natural ecosystems that are uh, targeted by the expansion of commodities. This is why we are using the term deforestation and conversion. Um, uh, Dave, I, I, you know, sorry, but the, there was a change in the slide again. Sorry. So. Uh, human rights are a critical element of it, uh, and it's not just about legal deforestation. Legal and illegal deforestation are uh, fundamental, and it is achievable. So we are having a set of elements that are proving that it is totally reachable. This is not an unachievable goal. Next, please. So. We have worked a lot in the past on uh, developing uh, solutions that are niche solutions, that are only regarding a very small portion of the market, and we realize that that is not changing the overall scenario. So we have now uh, a clear element, and all the frame uh, asked have, have been framed in order to be able to uh, achieve a scale that is uh, coherent, that is uh, uh, Equivalent with the actual scale of destruction that's happening. So we're having in some countries like Brazil, two million hectares of destruction per uh, year. So we have to have uh, an approach on eliminating deforestation that is reaching and matching that scale. Also, uh, it is not about individual supply chains. So if you are having a, a, a demand a buyer that is uh, asking for commodities that are free from deforestation for its own supply, but the supplier is continuing to, to uh, provide deforesting uh, supplies in uh, commodities for other customers, actually, uh, you are not reaching the scale that is necessary. So beyond greening uh, the supplies, there is a critical ask for greening suppliers. So having suppliers that are consistently removing deforestation and, and conversion from all their operations. And of course, you need to think of having positive in, uh, incentives, economic and technical, so that good production practice can be uh, implemented on the ground. And of course, we are having other recommendations uh, on the consumption uh, and the global food systems that are participating to that destruction but deforestation and conversion free is, is not the only recommendation, but certainly one of the most urgent to reach. So these are the, the, key, the key principles of what I'm going to present very quickly on, uh, on, on this, uh, on the ask. Please, next. So here is, uh, a very simple example of what we are asking for each uh, segment of the supply chain. For instance, for the upstream buyers, I'm just reading one, 
to ensure their own supply chains for all, all commodities and origins, as well as all land concessions and real estates are verifiably free from deforestation, converse, and human rights abuses. Then require the same for direct and indirect suppliers in the entire operation. Uh, and of course, a strengthened support for biomass solutions. So having something that is beyond the supply chain as well in the producing uh, landscapes. That is a very simple uh, synthesis, uh, and each of these specific boxes has been uh, detailed in 10 to 11 or 12 specific demand of action from each of these players. One uh, company or one government can be more than one of these players. So you have companies that are producers as well as buyers as well as financiers. And so for each of their specific role, the ask will be, uh, will be applicable for what they are doing uh, in, in these roles. Next, please. And so I will finalize here. Uh, these are uh, up, to, up to now. Uh, these this, this DCF, the WWDCF ask, uh, and principles and ask have been already applied in many other guidelines and recommendations uh, from different platforms. Here are some of the publications and also the, the partners that have used them until now. So I am at your disposal for any other questions. Thank you very much. Okay, many thanks for uh, Ron, for your impress, uh, impressive sharing of WWF vision and uh, recommendations on DCF supply chain. You introduced the rational and the objective of WWF guiding principles and asks for the DCF supply chains, which is also the products for the transformational process and some useful uh, example, uh, examples. Thank you very much again. And uh, the next speaker is Sofia Bosek, uh, Boske Barreto, uh, social environmental assistant of uh, agriculture chains in Imaflora, will share her findings on her uh, on the social and the environmental impacts driven by the cattle supply chain. Okay, many thanks, Sofia. Uh, this uh, floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Thank you, WWF and Trade Hub, for this space. I'm going to present about the social environmental impacts driven by cattle supply chain. So our main question here is, what are the social environmental impacts linked to beef production? Uh, next, please. First of all, it's important to make an introduction to understand how livestock is organized in Brazil. So in 2022, Brazil had more than 234 million cattle had. It was the largest herd in the world. As a consequence, pasture is the main land use in Brazil. As we can see in the graph, uh, Amazonia and Cerrado Biomes have the largest pasture areas in the country. Next, please. And in this map shows the cattle head by city in the legal Amazon region. We can see bigger numbers in Rondonia state, northwest of Mato Grosso and southeast of Pará. Next, please. So to organize my presentation, I divided the social environmental impacts of cattle supply chain into three categories. Land use change with deforestation and conversion of native vegetation, greenhouse gas emission and social impacts. Next, please. So when it comes to deforestation and conversion, MacBioma's project shows that in 2021, pasture areas corresponded to more than 70% of all the deforested and converted areas in Brazil. And in a historical analysis from 1992 to 2022, 55.8% of the areas converted to pasture came from native vegetation areas. The infograph shows that the conversion of native vegetation to pasture is much greater than the temporary, than to temporary crops. Next, please. 
other historical analysis found that between 1988 and 2021, about 90% of all the deforested areas in Amazonia were converted to pasture. Next, please. And when we look to Pan-Amazonia region, uh, all Amazonian countries region, the farming and cattle rising occupied 98.5% of the, to the total deforested over the last three and a half decades. Next, please. So in regards to greenhouse gas emissions, in 2019, Brazil was the seventh largest greenhouse gas emitter. And in 2021, Brazil was the fifth light largest methane emitter. The CO2 equivalent main emissions come from land use change, mentioning deforestation and conversion, and agriculture. Next, please. Therefore, deforestation, cattle raising, and greenhouse gas emissions are closely, closely related in Amazonia. In 2020, the same municipalities that headed the rankings for deforestation emitted the most CO2 equivalent and were home to the largest bovine herd in their states. Next, please. These municipalities were Porto Velho in Rondônia and Altamira and São Félix do Xingu in Pará. Next, please. And in regards to social impacts and human rights violation, we can mention modern slave labor and forced labor. A study found that between 1995 to 2022, over then 16,800 people were rescued in the cattle ranching sector in Brazil, of which over then 8,800 people were rescued in the state of Pará. So 55.55% of cattle ranching rescued workers were found in Amazonia, of which 74% were in the state of Pará. Next, please. The rescued workers are usually migrants looking for opportunities in the agriculture sector. 72% are men between the ages of 18 and 44. 90% have limited education, of which 30% are illiterate and 66% are Afro-Brazilian. Next, please. Focusing in legal Amazon region, the red circles in this map shows the numbers of work workers rescued during task force interventions in legal Amazon state's rural properties. As we can see, Eastern region of Pará state concentrates the largest numbers. Next, please. When it comes to violation in protected areas, studies found that they are still being used to produce Brazil's cattle. 3.3 million cattle head were sold directly or indirectly from private properties inside protected areas to slaughterhouses between 2013 and 2018 in Pará, Mato Grosso, and Rondônia. Another study found that livestock takes over 100 takes over than 123,000 hectares in indigenous lands. Next, please. In regards to social progress in the legal Amazon region, I study found that the 20 municipalities that most deforested had indexed 21% lower than the national average. Next, please. And finally, Brazil is the second deadliest country in the world to environmental activists. More than one in five of the 177 killings recorded globally in 2022 happened in the Amazon. Next, please. So what should the Chinese meat market do? They should monitor and verify the meat packers and slaughterhouses they are buying from. They should choose the ones with public commitments, monitoring systems, third-party audit, public results, and improvement action plans. They, should, they also should engage to supply chain traceability, including indirect suppliers, and social environmental monitoring systems with possible financial incentives. And they should utilize Beef on Track website available information. Beef on Track program information offers transparency in the beef in the beef value chain. Next, please. Finally, a brief, a brief introduction about the program. 
BFANTRAC articulates the meat production chain in the Ligo Amazon region, aiming at the implementation of commitments for chain free from social environmental irregularities. Here are our, are our website and LinkedIn links. Next, please. Uh, so the, commit, the committed meat packers must use the monitoring protocol for direct cattle suppliers, checking environmental criteria such as illegal deforestation and environmental embargo, documents criteria like rural environmental registry and animal transit guide, and social criteria like the slaver labor list. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, this, these are my references. Uh, next, please. Thank you so much, everybody. This is my con these are my contacts. Please feel free to write me. Thank you, everybody. Okay, many thanks, uh, Ms. Barreto, for your uh, reminding us the history of the DCF in Brazil and the social environmental impacts driven by the cattle supply chains and some information of the modern slave label and the forter label, and also the social progress index, and especially to, to give the Chinese meat markets some good suggest suggestions on the traceability. Very informative. Thank you again. Okay, now we have the uh, we have Marina Gill, B Fund Track Coordinator at Imoflora will explain the characteristics of the beef supply chains and the current context in the beef traceability space. Thank you, Marina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, everybody, for the invitation. Uh, very good to be with you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, <clears throat> so I will complement the presentation of my colleague, Sophia. Uh, bring in uh, a bit of the, the, co the context, the, the complexity of the cattle supply chain in Brazil and why it's so hard to address those issues that she raised. Um, next one, please. Um, so next one. I always start to really to explain how it's uh, the, the, the bovine chain is arranged in Brazil. So we have uh, different options on how the, the cattle producers can be organized. Uh, here we have this uh, chart that shows uh, different options. So we have basically three phases on cattle uh, ranching, that is the breeding, hearing and fattening. And it can happen in one single uh, farm as the, the lowest option in the chart, uh, but it's not the most common. It just happens uh, when the producer is very well organized and with a high level of uh, professionalism in their production, let's say like that. And it would then have like one farm before it's reached the, the, the meatpacker. Uh, those are the cases that are easier to uh, monitor social environmental issues because the cattle uh, have lived in one single farm for, in, for their entire lives. But for the other options where we have median or low visibility uh, of the, the farmers that are engaged in the production, uh, we can have uh, two or more farms before to reach the meat packer or three or more farms before to reach the meat packer. Then usually the meat packer, they are they have just the visibility of the the last uh, farmer uh, before the cattle reach the the meat packer. So they are direct suppliers. The previous farmers uh, are not visible for the meat packer, so it's very hard to monitor social environmental issues. And usually those other farmers are engaged in breeding and hearing. And this is due to the fact that uh, each one of these steps on cattle production has uh, some uh, singularities in terms of operation. So it's a kind of uh, a supply chain uh, specialization in each one of those cycles. So the most common arrangement is having uh, farms that are very focused on breeding and then the ones that are focused on hearing 
and the ones that are, are focused on fattening. So most of the farms have this first level of visibility that unfortunately is low. Next one, please. Uh, so why traceability is important for bivine and letter chains? So one thing is to guarantee the origin for sanitary issues. And the second one is to verify legality and other criteria, such as deforestation conversion free associated to land and to the producer. And uh, this uh, verification is can be important in the government level and also in the private companies level, not just for the meat packers, but also for retailers, downstream companies, finance, whatever organization that is committed to ensure legality or other criteria. Next one, please. Uh, I think you can go ahead. Uh, yeah. You can display everything already, please. So, uh, yeah, please fill the, the slide with the other levels. Thank you. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so here is a bit on the history of traceability in Brazil. Uh, it was mainly, uh, it started with the proposed to monitor sanitary issues and it's still like that. So we have two main um main ways on tracing back a cattle. One is the guide of uh, the guide of trains of animals. That is this document that is in the right side of the slide that brings where the where the cattle came from and where it is going. So it's a document that traces the movement of cattle. So it's mandatory and the farm that is uh, selling uh, the batch of cattle uh, has to uh, inform this document. And the one that is receiving has to also sign this document or not sign, it's kind of confirm that is receiving this, uh, this, cat, this batch of cattle. So it's being used mainly to ensure sanitary issues in Brazil. But the, the, the issue is that it's not allowed to be used for uh, with the proposals of social environmental uh, monitoring uh, as let, let's say as a national solution. There are some states that are starting to use that for these proposals, but in general, it's being used just for sanitary control. And uh, the, the, the next level of the movement of cattle can just see uh, the previous farm where the cattle have came from. So if uh, a farm has uh, bought uh, another batch of cattle from another farm, uh, the meat packer is not seeing this document, at least so far. And there is this other, um, this other system that calls SISBOV that is like uh, individual identification of animal system. So each, uh, each animal receives this ring that has a number, official number to trace each animal. So the difference from one system to the other is that the GTA is a, a cattle batch control and the SISBOV is a ring uh, or in the individual identification system. But it's uh, so far just applied for farms that are, uh, 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 are registered to sell to Europe and it covers just 1,100 farms so far. Next one, please. Uh, and uh, what we have in terms of social and environmental monitoring history in Brazil. So back in two, 2009, we had two main movements in Brazil in, in terms of um, pressuring or uh, asking meat packers to, to have this monitoring. One was uh, the public commitment on cattle ranging, ranging that was uh, something that came up after a Greenpeace report. So it was uh, um, a volunteer and uh, a kind of uh, sectorial agreement or commitment from the major meat packers at the time. And at the same year, the public prosecutor's office issued the terms of adjustment of conduct that is a, a legal uh, compromise of um, the, the companies on uh, committing themselves to follow a certain uh, set of criteria. Uh, so 
10 years after that, so in 2019, uh, the Public Prosecutor's Office, together with FEMA Flora, in consultation with multiple stakeholders, put together the MIFON track that is basically, uh, as Sophia has already introduced, that is basically uh, a guide that try to harmonize how those criteria under the public commitment of cattle ranging and under the terms of adjustment of, of conduct, how those criteria has to be monitored. Because between 2009 and 2019, each company uh, chose the one certain way on monitoring uh, those criteria. And we, it was uh, almost impossible to compare their performance because the means of verification and the methods differ. So this is trying to harmonize the method, the set of uh, um, means of verification, the databases and so on. So it brings a protocol with the criteria to be monitored, a protocol on how to audit it, and also um, uh, uh, one single reference in terms of transparency. But as Sophia has already said, and because of the lack of information terms, in terms of traceability, it's not like the lack of traceability data, is more the lack of accessibility to that because actually uh, the government already has the GTA available for uh, the whole uh, supply chain, but as it's not available to be used to social environmental monitoring, uh, this uh, guide has been used at least so far just for direct sourcing. Next one, please. And those are the criteria that Sophia has already introduced. So uh, basically they, they are uh, legal, uh, they are based on legal, inform infor uh, legal um, uh, information, uh, our database is available to monitor legality. And also um, it includes one additional criteria that is not covered by le uh, legal, the legal framework that is the legal deforestation that is volunteer. So the companies that are committed with uh, zero deforestation, they have to follow this criteria also. Next one, please. Next one. Yeah, so here we have, I will not go through the, the charts, just for you to know that we have uh, information in the website of uh, the Beef on Track, as Sophia already shared with you. And here we have some numbers that out of the uh, 153 slaughterhouses in operation in Amazon, we have a certain number of uh, uh, companies or meat packers that are under commitments, either uh, zero deforestation, illegal deforestation, uh, deforestation conversion free, or both. But we still have 46 meat packers without any commitment. And out of those uh, meat packers, we also have a certain number of companies uh, or meat, actor, meat, meat packers that have been passed through audits. Uh, some that uh, have been dispensed by the public prosecutor's office because they have a, just a, um, a, a low um, uh, volumes that have been uh, operated. And there are third five still that have, have not been passed through any audit, even that they would expect it to, to have conducted those audits. Next one, please. And here, just for you to see the, 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 the problem that it embeds, that is uh, how the, the supply chain sometimes um, builds some arrangement to escape of the TAC or volunteer agreements. So one irregular breeding or hearing farm can sell uh, cattle for another irregular fattening farms or irregular fattening farms and the regular fattening farm can sell that to regular fattening farms and it can reach the meat packer with full verif verification and be considered uh, compliant because actually the meat packer is just verifying the first level of, um, of sourcing. So this is the issue. Without uh, full traceability information, it's uh, very hard to cover the regularities or irregularities over the supply chain. Next one, please. There are some uh, very um, great initiatives trying to overcome this barrier of the lack of uh, data accessibility. 
So Selo Verde is one in, in Pará State, uh, Visipec, Conecta, SMGL, and also private technology and private company solutions. And they, they vary in terms of supply chain scope and geographic scope. So Selo Verde is an initiative in Pará State that covers the full herd of the state. But uh, um, at least so far, it's been used uh, in terms of um, cattle production and uh, Amazon just in the Pará State. It's also being used in Minas Gerais. That is another biome. And uh, Rodrigo will present it uh, soon for you with more details. And these other uh, initiatives are more like private solutions uh, or um, civil society solutions to, to private sector. And all of them are based either on DTA information, uh, but it lacks in terms of uh, the coverage of the accessibility for this information, or they rely on direct suppliers information of their indirect suppliers. So they are very great initiatives that try to overcome the lack of information from the government, but all then they, they have some gaps in terms of um, national as a national solution. Next one, please. And why having a national traceability system and it's, it's important and what would be the crucial features of, of this system? So this, this importance is to really reduce the risk of triangulation as I have uh, shared before that one farm, a regular farm can sell to the other and be considered uh, compliant to avoid leakage of social environmental pressures to less controlled ter territories and markets. So if we are just covering Amazon, for example, what usually happens is all the issues, social environmental issues has a leakage to other biomes like Cerrado and so on. Uh, it's also important to reduce costs by scaling the solution. And it's important for the country to attend new, mar new market demands. The features to really cover the social environmental monitoring uh, needs and also on sanitary ones would be to be mandatory or other uh, in terms of like uh, the coverage of the system with the purpose of sanitary and social environmental control. So now we have a system that covers the sanitary purposes, but it's not allowed to be used to social environmental controls in the, the national level. It has to ensure a certain level of transparency, at least for the, uh, the links in the supply chain that are responsible for the issues. And it, it's very important to have mechanisms that uh, are inclusive to farmers because any traceability system will put light in problems and the system has to embed uh, some routes for those farmers to get back into regu regularity through incentives and so on. Next one, please. Um, so the, this is uh, was uh, um, the main uh, remarks for for this piece, and uh, thank you very much. It will be a pleasure to continue the conversation. Okay, many thanks, uh, Gail, for reminding us the relevance of the complexity of a bio chain is very difficult for us to do the transform transformative work in global. This is also why the traceability is very important. Immoflora produces this beef on track is valuable to make the transparency in beef supply chain and mentioning the importance of having a national traceability system and the crucial features. Thank you again, Marine. Uh, thank you again, Gil. Okay, so next speaker is uh, Rodrigo Blazoni. Uh, he's the uh, doctor, uh, public policy specialist at the Center for the Territorial Intelligence in Brazil. Rodrigo will share the technical details of the Salovat in terms of the territorial intelligence, data governance, and the multi-stakeholders approach they adopt. Thank you, Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, thanks, Jan. Uh, just a small problem with the presentation. You're sharing my previous presentation in the webinar. I think it was the second round, but now they are gonna solve this soon. 
thanks for the invitation for us from the Center for Territorial Intelligence and the Federal University of Minas Gerais. It's a pleasure to be here talking about the beef traceability uh, possibilities in the state of Pará. As Marina and Sofia already mentioned, and also Jean and other colleagues, they mentioned there are some initiatives in place in Brazil and in Pará is only one example of how to trace beef or cattle in Brazil. We have plenty of opportunities and synergies happening here and just uh, to, you know what, for as a quick start before you, you put the presentation on, um, Marina told, told something about GTA, how it's gonna, how it's, it works right now in Brazil. It's a batch traceability system. So the, we have available data for us and other partners to make good analysis of the problems, the assess, assess, uh, accessibility of this data. You, you cannot access some, some data and that's, why it's very important to partner with state or federal governments to have access to official data and be able to run uh, uh, reliable analysis. So I'm gonna show you an example now on about how to run a proper analysis for the beef traceability in Brazil. Uh, can you see my screen? Is it working properly right now? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Yes, please, uh, next slide. Yeah, next, please. There we go. So Silverity is a science-based system in place in Brazil to support public policies. So we've been working to develop this methodology uh, across uh, the past, I would say, 15 years or so. We are part of a federal university here in Brazil. We've been developing spatial uh, uh, research here. That's why we have accumulated such a knowledge to come up with a tool which, is, which could be useful for uh, authorities in Brazil. And these are some of some examples of our method, how it's gonna be uh, submitted to these very renowned and international journals. And then you can go there and have access to our methodology. It's a transparent process. You can uh, check the assumptions we've been made so far. We can uh, send us some questions or suggestions to improve for the next version of the system we have. So just so you know that we've been working based on science and using uh, uh, evidence-based approach to come up with this two, which is in the case is celebrated for the state of Pará. Please, next. Yeah, in Brazil, uh, our, some of our colleagues already uh, mentioned that we have this uh, instrument, which is called CAR, the CAR instrument, the, or the CAR document in Brazil, which means the Environmental Registry, which is mandatory for every single farm in Brazil to submit their environment, environmental registry for the, the competent authority. And then the authority here, We'll check this information. Of course, this is a self-declared document, but we can check the information provided by the farmers or by the producers to, you know, check for compliance according to our main uh, body of legislation, the Brazilian Forest Code. And roughly uh, about half of all the native vegetation in Brazil is found or is located in private property. That's why it's so important to be able to monitor private properties in Brazil. And the main instrument to monitor private properties in Brazil is look at the CAR, the Environmental, environmental Registry for uh, every single farm in, this, in, in the country. And along with this uh, cattle transit permit, Marina uh, and Sofia uh, mentioned before. When you link car with GTA, you want to link environmental registry for that farm with the documents, the permits of, to, for, for cattle transportation will be able to trace the origin of that cattle. Next, please. And then these environmental registry have bring some information about the size of the property, the area of the property, the polygon, the uh, geographic, 
coordinates of that given property and along with uh, if, if this farm or if this farmer they have uh, surplus or deficit in terms of legal reserve or per, what we call here in Brazil permanent preserved areas and these areas are basically those located by rivers or close to mountains, top of the mountains and many other uh, different features of the terrain. We have to uh, uh, keep those native uh, uh, vegetation standing. And then there's a big, big real problem in Brazil. It's a big spatial problem because we are talking about seven more than actually, more than seven million properties and also adding uh, a complexity because this is a self-declare uh, information that you have to check the veracity of this information, not only approve or accept the information submitted by the producer, but also we have to be able to have a system good enough to be able to check this information and pass just the important information ahead. Next, please. Yeah, and then uh, we've been using these, all this information available in Brazil to develop a system that traces uh, uh, cattle to this origin. And then this is the most recent paper we have, not the, actually not the most recent, but the one of the most impactful papers we have so far, which is called the Rotten Apples of Brazil's Agribusiness. Can you go next, please? And then it shows how it would be possible to trace cattle in Brazil using uh, some regions as an example. And here, just a graph showing how it works. We have these uh, as Marina said, we have the slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse, they, you know, they have this commercial, their commercial activities, they buy from direct, direct providers, and these direct providers in turn would buy from indirect providers. And then you, you have to be able to check the compliance of all these providers being them indirect or direct. And just to give you, this is a hypothetical example, just to give you a general uh, view of how silver verde works. Let's say these green circles here mean or are deforestation-free farms, all of these. The red ones are defor deforested farms, so there are some deforestations identified here already. These are compliant farms, no compliant farms, and the gray ones mean that there's no documentation enough to be able to carry out a reliable analysis. So when you run this analysis, again, by linking the environmental registry for a given farm, let's say this farm, they have an environmental registry for this one, but they also have the cattle transit permits for, for the same farm. And then we cross reference all this information with high resolution satellite images. We can identify, we can check for compliance in every single level of the supply chain, being this the third, the second, or the first level to indirect supply, who, is, who in turn, it's going to be to supply to these direct suppliers and sell to these lower house. So we can certify or attest the compliance for these indirect providers, but also the direct ones, and then say, okay, this slaughterhouse is buying from reliable source. And in this case, in slaughterhouse number one, number two, for example, we have a different uh, picture here because they are buying directly from one slaughterhouse with problems. So we can promptly identify this problem and red flag these slaughterhouses because they are buying from a non-compliant direct providers. Or in other case, like this one, for example, they are complying for, uh, excuse me, they are buying for a compliant farm, but these, direct provider is buying for another indirect provider which has some problems being uh, the first station being forced to labor or any of those we covered according to the protocol of suppliers in the Amazon as they said. So we check the compliance as uh, the minimum requirements for compliance as someone asked me in the chat. So celebrity already does this, uh, uh, this verification and then we can uh, come up with intelligence reports like this. I will show you in detail later on what are the informations in this. Uh, next, please. So how this celebrated works, yeah, you can pass. It, it's, it basically merged or linked different data sets, like 
This one in your screen, on your screen, environmental, agricultural, land tenure, control and fiscalization, big data sets, and, and by these data sets, we mean maps for the first station, crop areas, pasture land in a given region, settlements, we identify indigenous lands, conservation units, public areas, and then we, we uh, look for, you know, uh, overlaps with these uh, uh, territories and we we'll also check data for fines, embargoes, seizures, and many other administrative uh, uh, measures on these farms. And then we cross-reference all these database with high resolution satellite images. So by doing this, we kind of specialize all these sort of data. So we take these, all these environmental all this agricultural and fiscalization data, which is like a mess, a bunch of data, uh, everything mixed together. And then we organize this data and put them in a map. So when you look at the map, you're gonna see points in the map. And if you click the map, so you see all the information for that farm because we cross reference to, uh, everything together before uh, uh, coming uh, with results. So we have this in a very visual way you can go to the Celebrate website, which, which is an official public policy in place in the state of Pará. It's important to recall that the state of Pará is, is the second largest cattle producer in Brazil, only behind the state of Mato Grosso. So it's a very important state, strategic state in terms of cattle production. So it's, uh, it has its importance in terms of cattle traceability and the usefulness of celebrated by uh, uh, being run in that state officially. Yeah, next please. Yeah, this is the platform or the system, how it is right now. If you go to this website here, semas.pa, PA is the state of Pará. Uh, if you go there right now, and if you have the car code, the environmental registry for a farm you, that you are interested in, you just type in this uh, car code in the website and then you get a full and comprehensive report for that specific farm, right? So today, Celebrity covers more than 300,000 300, rural properties in the state with daily updates. And by daily updates, we mean all those data data I just show you for environmental uh, uh, topics, uh, agricultural topics, fiscalization, all these, they are checked overnight. They are checked every day at midnight. So the next day, the information will be updated on the website. Next, please. And then just because we partnered with uh, the state government, we we have access to the GTA or the, the cattle transit permit and also other sensitive information for that state, for the state of Pará. And this partnership allowed us to come up with higher resolution satellite images for that region. We acquired this image and we've been working on some of them. And now we've been able to monitor this for the whole state, which is a large state in Brazil. We've been able to monitor and to uh, five meters resolution. So it's a very uh, detailed information you can get for a five meter pixel. And then because we have working on this so far, we, we've been able to identify many different and very detailed features of the terrain and then uh, estimate impacts uh, uh, more effectively. Next, please. Yeah, this is the document in, in the website. If you go there and put a car code, this is the car code, it's too small, but it, you, you can look at this later on. If you have any questions, just write me. Uh, the organizing committee, they have our contacts, just write to me and then we can uh, send you some supporting materials. But if you have access, if you are like from a retailer from China, and you want to check the level of compliance, the farm you are buying from or, you know, their, your, their suppliers are uh, providing you with some information. Just ask them for this number, ask them for the car code, take some notes, go to the uh, 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 the website in, in Parai State and check the compliance yourself. 
for that car. So here we have some information about the property. Uh, of course, there's no names, no text file numbers, no IDs, no sensitive data are displayed here. Only open uh, data can be uh, uh, assessed by anyone from civil society, anyone in Brazil and also abroad can go there and access this information. Just gonna show the level of compliance that farm or that farmer have uh, uh, regarding the forest, the Brazilian forest code. So if this farm is complying with the forest code, with the Brazilian law, of course, it's gonna be compliant with some uh, importing demands. If the importer is concerned about respecting local laws, it's just a matter of coming here and check your providers here and then uh, 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 separate, divide them into compliant and not compliant and engage with them to, uh, you know, to overcome some eventual uh, issues here. So we have this written document showing the surplus or deficits in illegal reserves in native vegetation in Brazil. If this farm has uh, some forced labor, if it is located over an indigenous land, a conservation unit, a public land, and many uh, different territories we have here in Brazil, we run this analysis for you. You don't have to comply and check in anything. It's an official document. It's an official report from the, the, the state of Pará, from the government in the state of Pará. And then you check, and just do, you know, the double check in the end, just to understand the level of compliance the suppliers you're buying from. And then, of course, along with this written information, this intelligence report, we will have some image. This is the model working on the platform and show you all this area in yellow is area used by raised cattle here and the areas in green. This means there's a river here. So it's a compulsory the farmer has to keep native vegetation along or by the river here. That's why it's, uh, it's highlighted in green. So the environment, environmental agents there in, in Pará, they know these features and they will talk to the producer if something is wrong here. And to make sure these estimates and all this written data here is uh, reliable and it can be compared, comparable to reality, we have this uh, uh, satellite images so the producer can check the compliance and make some questions to the authority if needed. So basically you will need the farm ID, which is in Brazil, it's known as CAR, C-A-R, the environmental registry for that farm. If you have the farm ID, you go to this website and put the, the farm ID, then you get the, the full report for that farm. And just look for these symbols here. If it's green, it's okay. It's according to the monitoring protocol for cattle suppliers in the Amazon. Uh, and of course, as these images show you, it includes geolocation and property boundaries and you know, many features of the terrain. And also again, protects commercial and, and, and personal sensitive data, the maps and the, ex the modeling exercise, they are done with high resolution at image. So it is a very reliable uh, estimate of the deforestation for that farm and so on. So basically it promotes transparency and traceability for all the suppliers involved. Next, please. Yeah, just a map of Brazil, just to show you the size of Parai State. So it's a large uh, state here. We've been covering, as I said, 300,000 farms here. And also we've been working with the state of Parai to the Brazil it is also official system to monitor soy, cattle, coffee, and planted forests in this state here, Minas Gerais. And also we've been partnering with the state of Maranhão, which is this one, one of our leading soy producers in the country. And just so we know, this tool, it's a very similar uh, framework or rationale is being used by the uh, prosecutor's office, as Marina said, they've been using this protocol to trace the origin of cattle in the Amazon. It all started here in the state of Pará, and that's why we, in the past, we decided to start our partnerships with this state, this state, because there was a political will at that time to, you know, 
to push this traceability and transparency agenda in the state. But now the success is so uh, evident in the state of Pará by using a, a similar tool as Celo Verde. We are part of the technical committee there, not only us, Ima Flora and other partners, we are part of the committee that have been supporting them with technical information and evolving our methodology to come up with better results every year. And after that, because of previous successful experience, the prosecutor's officers, officers there in, in, in this region, the illegal Amazon, they are deciding to go forward and use the same logic they've been using for the past years in the state of Pará, they're gonna use for this whole region here, including other states of the illegal Amazon. So it's, so it's, it's a evolving progress here and is gaining traction. The, the traceability and, and transparency trace, uh, agenda in Brazil is gaining traction. So that's why it's important for us to kind of showcase what we've been doing so far in Brazil for those who partner with us in trade aspects like China today, for example. Next, please. And as I said, in addition to Silo Verde for the state of Pará, in the state of Pará, we cover soy and cattle supply chains, but in Minas Gerais, we also cover, as I said, coffee and forest plantations. It's a partnership we have with uh, the UK embassy and also the European Commission. So we are today, we are talking to the Chinese market. We are talking a lot about Brazilian forest food, about respecting and following and abide by our, by our local uh, rules and laws, but also we've been working together with Europe and many other partners to understand how these two can be useful to meet other regulation criteria like the one, uh, the UDR, UDR, for example, which, you know, talks about the first station free uh, supply chains. Please, next. And very briefly, this is a summary of how Celo Verde works. First, we have an individual farm. So it's very important to highlight the system looks at every single farm in that given state. So in, we're not looking at the municipality, not looking overall at the state or for Brazil, we're looking for a given farm. So if you have a number, the idea of that farm, you can come up with a very comprehensive report for that farm in terms of social environmental impacts because we've been able to use official documents and that was possible because we partnered with these governments in the past. Of course, we went to go uh, 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 to the national level, but we have to engage to the national government and we've been doing so, not us ourselves, but also with the help of our partners here in Brazil, Ima Flora is one of them and then we have WWF as well, but we have many others here. We've been engaging with the federal government to become uh, such an approach, not celebrated, it's separate, something which is able to trace uh, with uh, a, a high level of accuracy, the cattle uh, supply chain to be, you know, use it in, at a national level. So the first step is to look at the farm, check for compliance in terms of environmental law here in Brazil. If something is wrong, <clears throat> the environmental agents will be, will know this, you will be notified, the farmer will be notified there's something wrong there. There's a specific protocol this farmer has to comply to you know, uh, be able to come back to the market, to be available uh, as a provider in the system. And then we check the compliance again, if everything is okay, we move to the next step. We check their compliance, not only in terms of documentation, but also in terms of uh, satellite image, we look for the first station after a given cutoff date. This cutoff date here in Brazil is 2008 because our forest code, but we can change this to meet different criteria. We can run analysis, analysis, for example, for the last year for 2020 or so on. Just uh, so you know, we can uh, run analysis based on one cutoff date, based on the territory or whatever you like. So we check for the compliance in this case for coffee and then also we add another uh, in layer of analysis for cattle, for soy, for forest splendor, whatever you like. And then finally, we come up with this report saying, is it okay or not? If it's okay, the product will be a test by the government saying as a, uh, uh, as a deforestation free 
uh, source. And then, you know, the market can use it as uh, daylight. So just to show you how it works, I think, I think that's all. Maybe I'm going to stop here. Can you, yeah, next, yeah, that's it. Any doubts over here, just ask so thank you. Okay, many thanks, Mr. Bellazzoni, for introducing us this science-based system to support the public policies. This, that is uh, Celovert, which uses the CAR platform as a tool to do the online environmental registry, which makes the livestock traceability is a real, real, uh, reality, especially attesting the deforestation-free farms Salovert covers the mod, uh, commodity like soya, cattle, now also and the coffee and the uh, forest plantations. Okay, thank you again. Uh, at last, but certainly not least, we have the player to count on Bella Lim, meet business manager at Xiamen CND Food Service Company, who will talk about the beef traceability context from a China international trade perspective. Okay, hello, Bella, the floor is yours. Oh, hello, hello everyone. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is Bella Lin I'm from CND company, a uh, state owner company. Uh, I do uh, beef supply chain for about 10 years before I was in Haitou uh, company. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to hear to um, talk about the supply chain of traceability of beef. Uh, so next, please. Mm. So what about the government do its traceability of supply chain? Current the state of the industry transparency, the significant and the difficulties. It's today I want to uh, talk about. Next, please. So um, at the import, the import of frozen beef can be traced back in China. At present, uh, the foreign factories have a access system. Uh, they have the number, uh, the factory number. So we just can uh, import the, the uh, plant who has the access, uh, who has passed the access system, they have the number. So you have the complete certificates, like healthy certificates, certificates of original and uh, original act. And so the uh, double names of customers declaration, you can see the buyer, the consignee, the agency, the consumer, and the user. They be units, uh, units in the process uh, are connected to achieve the transparency. So uh, next, please. So at present, it's not allowed to change the certificates and the the customer orders. So the term, uh, terminal can directly see the importers and the source during the transaction. Uh, just to see uh, who import the products, but they can see uh, it's difficult to directly see how many numbers in the middle. So how can we uh, see who, who uh, in the middle. So next. Uh, the middle, the government uh, do what in the middle? So uh, is they throw the flow of funds to achieve traceability. They can uh, throw the invoice to achieve the traceability. And also uh, you, can, you can see uh, the font and uh, the invoice Mm, you can you can find how many numbers in the middle. Uh, they need to pay the tax. Also, can see who in the middle. Maybe one fox will be three or or even more or five uh, middle mi middle traders. Okay, next. 
uh, the tax, uh, the taxation of end user like factories, restaurants, platforms, and uh, retail, they need to pay. So from from that way, you can you the government can um, help to achieve traceability. Next. Uh, what about uh, the logistics to achieve the traceability? Uh, in China, the logistics they can uh, have um, to achieve logistics traceability through logistics traceability, such as intercity business administration, system registration during the epidemic, flow control, such as two the mission code managed during the epidemic. Next. Uh, like warehouse value and uh, ledger uh, and uh, from high speed document inspection, urban um, circulation registration. And uh, the finished products also need to check the material documents need to be within the warranty period. So let's to reach the reach the, the, the goal. Next, please. Uh, so I also need I also want to talk about the significance and the difficulties because smuggling, you know, smuggling is um, it's uh, it's very very dangerous and uh, more and more right now, um, and the uh, change the packaging uh, affect the market price, affect the the uh, goods price, and uh, food safety cannot be guaranteed. Guaranteed uh, effort have been made to promote the traceability, the frozen meat supply chain. However, on the other hand, the process is difficult to uh, monitor and the document substitution sure cannot be avoided. On the other hand, the smuggling sur surface and uh, have a huge impact on market price. Uh, it can be, uh, cannot be avoided. Next. Uh, that's that's what I want to talk about. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Bella, for reminding us that traceability of the beef supply chain, current state of the industry, transparency, significance, and the difficulties of the beef supply chain. This information is very practical and uh, useful for the beef trade, and uh, we also need to think about that uh, integration that information into our transformation of DCF uh, supply chain. Okay, thank you again, Bella. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, with this wealth of knowledge the speakers have shared with us, we are now ready to start the Q&A session. Julie, I'm sure the, uh, I'm sure the attendees have posted very uh, interesting questions now. Which one would you like to raise first? Yes, Ying, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for posting so interesting uh, questions on the chat. The truth is that most of them have already been answered uh, online already. So um, let me check, I double check again. But the first ones have most of them been answered already. I have here one that says, um, Marina mentioned about the national traceability system. Any discussions for Celo Verde to be considered uh, one of, of the candidates? There was a very similar question before uh, asking about the possibility of having a mandatory national traceability system too. So Marina, what are your thoughts about, um, yes, the potential of the Celo Verde for being uh, the national traceability system. I think this might be a question for Rodrigo, in fact, too. Um, and, and Marina can have a thought around uh, beef on track also as a potential option. So you want, who would like to start? 
Yes, please, Marina, go ahead. You can start it. Yeah. Okay. So I think that uh, maybe it's useful to share what is uh, happening now in terms of discussion of national traceability system in Brazil. So there are mainly two approaches. One that is focusing on developing an individual identification national traceability system that would be like, uh, in summary, maybe to expand what CISBOV is or, or the ring uh, identification of each animal in the national level. Of course, that is a huge work with have you you need some time to be put in place for the national scale uh, and this is something that has has been discussed with the agricultural ministry so this is one one thing the other thing is how we could start using the information that is already available that is the gta the the, the guide of uh, animal transit as celebrate is doing uh, in minas gerais as it's a batch uh, control, a, a batch of cattle control, it has some challenges in terms of traceability because it traces batches of animals and not uh, individual animals. But even though for the sake of uh, social environmental purpose, it would be a, a very huge step, even though, um, and this is what Parai State is, is doing there. And of course that it has a very, uh, important potential to be scaled up to other states. It relies a lot on political will. So uh, one way or the other, like uh, using the, the GTA or individual, in, individual identification of animals uh, would uh, be a big step. Uh, as far as we understand, Celebrate is a, a wonderful system it still needs to add some, uh, some steps to be really used in terms of informing purchases and so on. As Rodrigo was saying, like having the government engaging uh, with the irregular farmers to get back into uh, compliance and then to have like direct suppliers clean it of their irregularities. Uh, and this is already in the way to, to, be, uh, to be improved in this regard. So, yes, I would say that, yes, if it's political will to scale uh, celebrate to a national level, then it would be a great tra uh, national traceability system that could be added with individual animal identification in the way, you know, so the DTA could embed uh, individual uh, identification of animals in the future. Rodrigo, what, what would you like to add uh, to Marina? Thank you, thank you so much, Marina. Very interesting. Sure, thanks, Marina. Thanks, Julie. I'm gonna add my two cents here. Marina already explained how it works, what's the difference between batch traceability, which is covered by GTA, uh, the transit permits for cattle in Brazil, and the difference for with to individual traceability or tagging. Uh, but the thing is the most important point in her uh, speech was about the political will, but it doesn't matter if it's gonna be batch or individual traceability, if you do not have the buying from politicians. And it's very, this is very clear here in Brazil, not only the state level, but also at the federal level. And that's why you've been engaging so much with them for the past many years, you were living proof of these here, all of you working with the Brazilian stakeholders who've been engaging at the state level, but also at the federal level and in struggling against this resistance from uh, the agricultural sector sometimes. Part of them, they are very concerned about showing some aspects of the supply chain. We understand that, uh, but you know, uh, we've been taking part with some high level meetings at the Ministry of Agriculture here in Brazil and the secretary it's himself told us that we cannot deny, no longer keeping denying these real facts. We have to change our behavior. We have to use these tools or initiatives or protocol already available for us to better control, to better monitor and understand the problems in our supply chains and effectively engage with those non-compliant 
and maybe perhaps come up with financial special uh, financial credit lines for those to be integrated, you know, to, you know, uh, uh, proceed with some reforestation there and so on. And also some financial incentives for those who are already compliant. So, yeah, and from our experience, not only in the state of Pará, but other uh, working groups we've been taking part here in Brazil is that batch traceability is now more than enough that we need to show the big numbers, to start, you know, monitoring the cattle, the soy, the coffee, many different supply chains we have here in Brazil. And we've been talking a lot about individual traceability for the cattle sector, but at the same time, we've been doing batch traceability for grains, for commodities traded in bulk. We don't have to trace every single grain. So it's been used and, you know, and accepted as a very reliable source of traceability when we, we trace batch for cereals, for grains, but not for cattle. We understand the sanitary complexity that has behind the cattle supply chain, but so far, we believe that individual traceability will take too longer to gain traction in Brazil, like two, we're talking about one, two, three, five years from now to have access to these numbers, to be able to track individually every single uh, uh, animal in more than, you know, seven million farms, I don't know. So it's going to be a huge challenge to deal with such a large amount of data. We have to have a system very robust to be able to run and do the maps for all of these animals. And that's why we are advocating for the batch traceability at this time, because it's the most red, red and useful tool we have so far. So we start yesterday monitoring our supply chain. So it's there, it's in place. We have to use this. And at the same time, of course, we're not against individual traceability, but at the same time, evolving gradually to, you know, uh, uh, implement the individual traceability. But until that happens, we have to keep in stick with this batch traceability because it's the best tool we have so far in Brazil, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Um, so, um, if we think from a consuming uh, region perspective, for example, from the Chinese market perspective, what are the kind of decision making processes? that can be informed by the available data and how they should be accessing this data in an efficient way. So if, if you put yourself uh, in the boots of, of the buyer in a major brand, in a major retailer firm, what are the kind of decision-making processes they should be informing based on this available data that we do have in producing regions such as Brazil? Can I start that? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, anyone who wants to want add to this. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Marina and Sofia brought us some information about the protocols uh, we have in the Amazon region and also uh, brought some information about a system which is able to monitor the supply chain. We, we merged these two different approaches here in Brazil to come up with these. Uh, I call intelligence report for, you know, for, for not only producers, civil society, but also the buyers. So if I was a buyer in trying to make some trade with Brazil, I would go for this official systems in place or the protocols or initiatives in place in the region I'm buying from and just check the indicators these protocols are demanding. And after that, if you have the farm ID or some information about your supplier, you can already go there and put some information in the website and check for the compliance yourself. I think it would be a very starting point to understand uh, uh, the level of compliance of your supply chain because it's a, it's a system in, pla in, in place there in Brazil. I will start from that. And just so we know here in this conversation, we've been partnering with a very renowned Chinese NGO because we are already concerned about our traders 
And this time with China, we are partnering with them to come up with a pilot, which uh, will be like a dry run for the state of Pana and run celebrated with real data, data from the retailer sectors in China and the list of their suppliers there in the state of Pana. We will be able to locate then where they are located and where they are buying from, what are the slaughterhouses involved in there. Uh, uh, trade relationships so that we come up with intelligence report for that part of the supply chain. So our local initiative, our local reports will be used, will be available for the Chinese market, market to make better decisions. So I think it will be a very good starting point. Okay, does anyone want to add uh, to Rodrigo's answer? Uh, it seems uh, that uh, the, the data is there the mechanisms are there, but um, if we think of the capacity of the, for example, the workforce in a retailer company, or they might not have the capacity building that it is required to execute this, right? And also the resources. So I was wondering if there's a third party already ready to provide this kind of services to retailers and major brands to just give the information straightforward the information that is needed to take decisions in terms of procurement um, in rather than expecting to have someone who manually checks for all the batches and all the potential or um, origin regions um, uh, the, the the platforms um, yes i see two hands raised marina and jean marina go ahead your hand is is first Yes, I think one important thing is that um, considering the, the, the agreement, uh, the, the, the terms of adjustment of conduct from the meat packers, it's important that Chinese importers is aware that uh, most of the, the meat packers operating in Amazon, they or they have signed the terms of adjustment of conduct or, or they, they were exempted on assigning it. And it's an, an information that's already available. So they can check if the meat packers, they have a terms of adjustment of conduct or not, if they, are, if they have any commitment, and if they have been auditor, audited or not. It's an information that is already available. So the Chinese important can already see what the meat packers are doing in relation to their direct sourcing. So this would be the first step. The information is already there. So they have been passed even through third-party audits. So it's a very reliable system in terms of their direct sourcing. And it's Thank very you. important to, this is a very important, just to, to finalize, it's very important to understand that even for those, they, are, they, they do have some non-conformities. And what we, uh, we think that is import, important for importers is to understand what the meat packers are doing to solve those issues. And it would uh, be also true for indirect suppliers when it's possible to, to trace them back. Thanks, Marina. What would you add, Chang? Just uh, adding that, yes, there are people ready in China to help retailers implement these systems and also help adapting the interface uh, to the Chinese context. And I could mention WWF China, which is here uh, organizing with us this event and already engaging many buyers and uh, and, and retailers in uh, the respect of traceability uh, from Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, special, a special thank you to all speakers uh, who have shared their knowledge and, and experience with our audience globally and your excellent answers to all questions. Uh, we have had lots of questions uh, in the, during this webinar, which is a very, very good sign that the, the contact that you shared is really relevant for, for the people who connected today. Uh, Ying Wang, uh, thanks so much for, your, for moderating this session. Uh, I give you the word um, to, to have a few words um, to close the session and I will then just have a brief okay. um, remark. Thank you, Julie, and thank you all the uh, speakers and audience today. Uh, we truly have a very informative uh, 
webinar uh, with all of you guys and uh, very valuable to uh, digest digest it uh, after our meeting. Uh, as the time uh, is over, so we uh, I think we should close our uh, webinar today and uh, thank you all of your uh, efforts today again. Okay. Thanks so much, Ying Wong, uh, special expert moderator. This is our last, last uh, webinar uh, for now, which is followed by this week by two in-person workshops focused on soy and beef traceability in Beijing. And we will be sharing the outcomes from these uh, private discussions in the near future with all of you, of course. We look forward to keep connected. Um, and thanks so much uh, to all attendees for having been part of this journey that is just about to start. We know that some of you have been following the four webinars in these two months, and we very much look forward to seeing you again in our next activities focused on traceability. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank bye you bye. all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.